Hi, and welcome to the Punk CX podcast. My name is Adrian Swinsko, and I'm a, an advisor, best-selling author, speaker, and general explorer when it comes to customer and employee experience. I'm really interested in figuring out what it takes to build organizations that produce better outcomes for both customers and employees. So with that in mind, I seek out and interview CEOs, entrepreneurs, business and tech leaders, authors and academics to uncover some clues about what it takes to build this, such an organization. Now, some of you may know the podcast as the Rare Business Podcast, but I decided to rename and rebrand the podcast recently. This is for a number of reasons. First one was to mirror the title of my book, Punk CX, which was published in June 2019. Uh, two, because I'm a fan of punk music. And three, it's just more fun, right? Anyway, if this is your first time listening to one of these interviews, then hello and welcome. And please do dive into the archives at adrianswinsko.com as I've now completed over 300 of these interviews in the last few years. If this is not your first time listening, then welcome back and thank you. Anyway, that's enough for me right now. Let's get into the interview. So welcome to the next edition of my podcast, which has just been rebranded as Punk CX, uh, exploring customer experience with myself, Adrian Swinsko. Uh, it used to be called uh, the Rare Business Podcast, but you know, that got a little bit boring. Uh, and then I brought this new book called Punk, which I really, I really enjoy, and it's full color. Anyway, so in line with that, I am bringing a bunch of guests onto the podcast that are full color in themselves. And today, I, with me, I have Joseph Michelli. Hi, Joseph. How are you doing? I'm great. I, of course you would go to Punk CX because you would be anything but boring. So lovely to be with you, Adrian. <laughs> Perfect. Joseph, now we've known each other for a wee while and you've done a bunch of different things. You're, we're in a sort of similar sort of space. But rather than me letting the cat out of the bag, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and also the work that you do? Well, I'm a fan of yours, so that probably makes me credible right there. Awesome. Um, be, be, beyond that, though, uh, I've been doing CX kind of like you. I think probably longer than it's actually had its own title called CX. Mm-hmm. You know, back in the days when we were talking about customer service or ways to enhance it. You know, yeah. uh, some some elements of the customer journey. So, um, so I've been doing it for a long, long time, and have written a bunch of books now. I think it's my tenth. Uh, about companies that I've worked with. Um, so it's always been an honor to write books like Mercedes-Benz book or Ritz-Carlton or Zappos or mm-hmm. Starbucks books. But um, this one, I'm very excited about Airbnb. I think it speaks to a changing time. Um, yeah. And so hopefully we can you know, get into just how the world has changed from the days when uh, we were talking service to maybe early days of customer experience to what is relevant now. Perfect. Now, as you just alluded to, you publish a number of a number of books but the recent one is called the airbnb way five leadership lessons for igniting growth through loyalty community and belonging now so like i ask everybody who kind of writes books on here that i think can add to the conversation and you know to the community and the learning that needs to go into sort of delivering a great um service and experience i mean can you tell us about about the book and how it came about and Who's it for? Central central thesis, you know that sort of like stuff. Yeah, thumbnail, sure, thumbnail, sure, thumbnail sure. Sketch. Yeah, you know, so <laughs> I always write books for the uh, the person who's trying to improve customer experience in their business, but in the process, I hope to tell a lot of stories mm. so that people who you know just are thinking about serving one another, even outside of a formal business setting, might find some principles that are relevant to them. Right. So that's always the mindset. You know, this book is another classically two-year book for me. I write them, it takes me about two years between working with companies and doing the research and six months of writing and then however long it takes for a publisher like McGraw-Hill to get it out into the market. So it's always about a two-year journey. Back in the day, um, I was given permission by one of the founders, Brian Chesky, to write this book. So nice. essentially, you know, it, a lot of fun, I think what these brands do is they say, okay, he hasn't, he hasn't screwed up any other brand story too hmm. badly yet. So maybe we'll give him a go with us. And so, um, yeah, so I've been given a chance to talk about their story. And I think it is an interesting world that we live in. The sharing economy has changed things quite a bit. And all of us are hosting today. Mm-hmm. Um, you're hosting me on your podcast, most graciously. Thank you. And, you're welcome. you know, I'm hopefully uh, co-hosting with you in the sense of this audience. And, you know, in, in 10 minutes, you know, I'll either be hosted as a guest of someone else or I'll be hosting someone. It's just the way things are today. And more and more leveraging the things we have or using the things we have are part of the the deliverables of the mm. customer experience. So uh, it was time for me to kind of move on and, and do this book over the last couple of years. Perfect. Now, so 
I mean, I know that, uh, as you say, you've written a whole bunch of um, a bunch of books about different kind of companies, you know, from the Mercedes Benz to Starbucks to Zappos to the Ritz Carlton and things. Um, but rather than just going through this kind of like soup to nuts, as it were, what I thought I'd like to do is just dig into some of the lessons that you've that you've lifted out from the the book, or you kind of I feel like gleaned from your research to give people a bit of a flavour of some of the stuff in the book, if I may. So. Absolutely. You know, I, I guess it, we just start off with the first concept, which is belonging. And I think it's a big lesson. Like, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, I, think I mean, what does that mean? Brands, I mean, for, for kind of like for Airbnb and just more broadly. Well, first off, Airbnb has a, uh, has a huge challenge, right? So they are a brand that has 3000 people running it, right? So mm -hmm. small company in many ways, they're valued at $38 billion as they go to a public offering next year. So a uh, small in number, but great valuation, but they rely almost exclusively on the delivery of the actual experience through a group of independent business owners yeah. who are leasing out their space in their garage or their yurt or their teepee or wherever they're wanting to put someone up. And, mm -hmm. and so they're reliant on those people to deliver an experience. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you think about many of the companies you and I've probably worked with over the years, a lot of times it's trying to help a leader with his people who get a paycheck from him or her directly. Right. Yeah. Um, so they, in, you know, there's some control over the customer experience in those settings because if people can't deliver it and you coach them long enough, uh, ultimately you may be able to encourage them to go somewhere else to not deliver that experience mm. through them. Uh, so yeah, so th I think that's very different. And then I, you know, I did a Mercedes book where they were really focusing on helping dealerships, car dealers. Mercedes helps the car dealer deliver the branded experience that has Mercedes on the outside of the building. And the, um, the key but, challenge with that book as well is, is moving the culture from being product focused to more of a servitization type of model as well. I love how well read you are. Yes, that was kind of like the whole value proposition, I think, of that book. But you know, you get to Airbnb and then you go out and you have a, a, this much more extreme situation. You don't have a you don't have a dealership agreement between Mercedes and those dealers with lots mm. of equity for both sides. All you have is somebody posting their little room uh, on this website. And yet you as Airbnb want that person and all these hosts across mm -hmm. the globe to do something that is branded in the customer experience. So belonging is at the center of the branding of the Airbnb experience. It is the inspiration, the true north that says to all of the hosts, whether they're you know, small business owners or just a grandma who's trying to make rent so that, or, you know, assure that her, she doesn't lose her house. Mm. Um, it, she, they're trying to get them all to say, when people stay with you, at the end of it all, make sure that they feel as if they can belong anywhere. Mm. Um, and, you know, that's an interestingly simple concept, but what if we all tried harder to make sure that when people arrive on our website or they arrive, you know, on this podcast, they know that this is where they belong. You belong in this podcast. This is right for you. You are so, this is, this is a perfect place for you and we welcome you with open arms. What if that was authentically communicated more aggressively in every business? Like we didn't let anyone leave without feeling belonging. Right. Uh, right. You know, we were intentional about it with such, and, and that's really a bit at the heart of what Airbnb has communicated. It's done a very good job, I think, getting it out to the host community. It's understood why belonging is so important to human mm. beings that, you know, they, uh, they were fortunate. I'm sure you, uh, you know, in your readings with Chip Conley to be a big part of the early foundation. So Chip wrote, you know, peak how, Companies get their mojo from Maslow, and he was in charge of Joie de Vivre Hotel Company in San Francisco and went over to Airbnb and bringing this understanding of Maslow and how Maslow said, you know, we have these basic needs like housing yeah. which you can get through Airbnb, but we have higher level needs, which are associated with things like, you know, you know, expressing your full self actualization. Yeah. And then that next level down is belonging. It's a mm. very high need for human beings. Once we're safe and we're fed, we really want to belong. We want to know we're not alone in the universe. Yeah. And so this is a very, it's a very psychologically driven prospect. It's brought in through great experts and it's communicated very effectively into the, into the host community. So if I can jump around a little bit, I mean, then I jump to, I mean, let's do like a, just, just yeah, just jump around a little bit. If I then jump to the sort of lesson five, which is in the, or the part five of the book, which is about community is is that therefore an extension of that? 
I think it is. No, I think it is, but, <coughs> but it is a bit different. So, you know, they, they definitely have Conley they bank off of, right? And he's really into belonging. Then they have this guy by the name of Douglas Atkin. And, and Douglas is an interesting guy. He wrote a book called Culting of Brands. Mm. And he was uh, not only a, an advertising guy who tried to understand what were the intense emotional drivers that built a connection to a brand. But then he went out and he started Meetup, which was the offline uh, meeting, yeah. you know, uh, website where if you had an interest, you could find somebody else who had Pomeranians and you could go and meet with that community yeah. offline, right? Uh, but then he got involved in activating communities. And so he started looking at communities on the move, which we would call movements, right? So right. you take a commu community, get them on purpose and get them moving. So community for Airbnb is the online and offline community building. So not just the guest arrival experience that says you belong in this house in Milan and we're gonna take care of you and you're not just a number like you would be at some chain hotel. It goes beyond belonging and it moves into this concept of how about we pull together all these people who have similar interests and get them moving in the direction of say belonging, but mm. also get them moving in the direction of home sharing rights, right? So a lot of these communities, and I've hung out in these Airbnb host communities, a lot of them are doing social projects uh, on behalf of homelessness or other related areas. So right. they're, they're doing good uh -huh. as a grouping of hosts. And they're also out there actively fighting laws that try to restrict their ability to use their homes to generate revenue. Right. So um, anyway, that, that that's kind of the, I think community takes on an element of belonging, but it's much more about building these interconnections of relatedness on a purposeful journey toward um, moving that community in a positive way. Perfect. I mean, so then if I can then rewind again, kind of like um, uh, back to the sort of the, 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 the sort of the next big thing that came out of it, you talked about trust and it, and in my understanding with Airbnb was, I mean, it's just, it's a really, really simple uh, idea is that you know how do we how do we make ourselves feel comfortable with strangers effectively oh uh, yeah you know what i mean totally. and yeah. that's that's like the, the the biggest hurdle that they, they you know that they, they uh they had to sort of uh, it felt like to me they had to kind of get over so tell me a little bit about sort of the the idea about like this designing for trust and safety because it's a big thing it's a natural fear right it goes back to your maslow's hierarchy of needs yeah, and, and people who want to design great customer experiences always have to design against something, right? And they have to optimize for something. And, and various products have different, uh, different resistance points that you have to design around. And for Airbnb, trust is like quintessential. And who, isn't, who in their right mind is going to stay in a house with an absolute stranger, right? Or who in their right mind is going to leave their precious home in the hands of an absolute stranger. It's, it's a crazy idea. And many investors in the early days wouldn't touch it. Yeah. You know, there's no way this is going to make money because uh, this is a failed human experiment. Mm. And so I think what they did to design for trust, I mean, in, in many ways, these are the founders of this company are, are designers. They went to the Rhode Island School of Design. So design yeah. is in their mindset. They're always looking for, you know, listen, identify the need state, mm. ideate, prototype, yeah. execute, right? So that's their mind space. But when it comes to trust, I think uh, there's a brilliant, brilliant uh, TED talk done by one of the founders, Joe Gabbia. So clearly your listeners might want to check out Joe Gabbia at TED. Mm. And he, it's literally titled Design for Trust. And he talks about things, including his own sense of the emotional fear that comes with this and how he, in his own early days, uh, rented out a space and was completely freaked out about whether or not the guy was going to hack him in the middle of the night. Right. So, I mean, so I think having that deep empathy, right, yeah. that deep empathy for what the problem is, and then it's using design principles like, well, how do we increase the likelihood that people don't feel quite like strangers when they arrive at the doorstep? How do we maybe create a dialogue through the app and how do we create just the right size text box mm. in that dialogue with just a couple of right questions that if a person answers, it enables me to feel like you're a little less of a stranger. Like I've got a pre warm up and we're building a relationship before your arrival. And then I think the big one is their reputation system, right? We're right. all being judged by reputation systems online. They've just done an exquisite job of managing all the biases to make maximum objectivity happen. Things like mutual 
mm-hmm. evaluations, kind of mm-hmm. what Uber does, right? That notion yeah. that I get to evaluate you, you get to evaluate me. It kind of keeps us on a little bit better behavior. Yeah. And they had to get to a point of a mutual reveal. So in the old days, we'd both be expected to, you know, to judge each other. But if you went first, then I could wait and then I could zing you yeah. if uh, I felt uh, a revenge judgment was needed. And now they just reveal it at the same time. They don't give you a, a, a long period of time to do the evaluation so that you don't have any bias of, you know, delayed re- recall. Right. Just really brilliant stuff in the way they design the reputation system so you and I can be more reliant on what's being said about you as a host and me as a guest or vice versa. And that kind of seems to kind of like then sort of play into, link into this, you know, almost the, um, it's not just the culture of Airbnb, but it's also the, you know, the culture of the community and, you know, the, the host, because the, the next thing that came out of it was, you know, uh, your lessons that were big themes is this thing around hospitality. I'd be interested to understand how, I understand kind of all the things that they're doing around, you know, the host and the community, building trust and all that sort of stuff. But what is the, the hospitality bit? How is that sort of different? I mean, is that kind of, well, yeah, just tell me, how is that, how is that different? How does that extend those other sort of like themes? I think that's the, the key word is the extension of the theme, oh, right? So, okay. so if you're going to do, you know, if you're going to be able to trust somebody, you're going to be able to trust them because they do basic service elements well, right? They right. are responsive. They communicate with you in a clear and effective manner. What they claim about their product or property is what they deliver against. There is convenience in the way they go about making sure that that happens for you and on and on. All of which I would call just good service behavior. Yeah. So we want to be able to trust that that's there. And so we should be able to rate that. So all those mm. things are rateable. Um, but there is an emphasis and there's a lot of focus and training. And if I were getting scores on one of those dimensions that were somewhat low, Airbnb is going to send me as a host just in time training to say, hey, you know, you're not doing you're getting fours out of five on on cleanliness. And here are some tips that people tend to focus on if they want to drive that score up. So there's a certain intentionality to trying to help hosts, you know, spot where their deficits are in some of those basics of service and, and build on them. And right. then there's a, what, what I think Danny Meyer has called enlightened hospitality. And right. it's that next level, right? It's right. that, okay, you got the basics down, you can transact service. Now, let's talk about the emotional connectivity. How well are you doing at anticipating the needs of your guests? Right. How well are you doing at creating this, this sense of kind of magical travel uh, and memorable travel? Right. Because I, you can do it all right, and it's not magical or memorable, right? It's just, it's just all right. Yes. Um, and so I think for me, it, the, a lot of this stuff on hospitality is teaching both the nuts and bolts, the basics of service excellence, and then the enlightened hospitality, service with heart, as uh, Chip Conley would call it. Yeah. Um, so it's in how do you invest the emotional connectivity uh, to be memorable? And then the final lesson, now uh, the final theme that comes out of it is this uh, empowerment. Um, and I know we might have done these slightly out of order and then hot this, the empowerment might be the one that, that connects hospitality with community, but tell me about kind of like the, the empowerment. I mean, is that again, another extension of all of this and therefore it feels like different stages? Yeah. You know, I think the beauty, out. the beauty of principles is you really don't need to go in any order and you don't have to worry about boundaries. They should yeah. extend well beyond boundaries and time and industry and, and they should be able to stand on their own merit and empowerment does. I mean, in the Airbnb world, look, they're, they're building a product based on people being willing to take a risk as entrepreneurs, right? Sure. I've never run a business in my life. I want to rent out some space. I don't know how to market it. I don't know how to price it. I have no flipping idea what expectations are. You know, how, how do you run a business? You know, in the old days, what we do is we just franchise with somebody and they, you know, we pay a lot of money and they give us all of that as part of right. the franchise business. This is kind of like a franchise without a franchise agreement. You know, right. it's, 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 giving me the ability to simply, you know, teaching me how to list this on my website, how to take the pictures on the website, uh, giving me a pricing engine that, that varies based on supply and demand and other considerations, uh, giving me the marketing. You know, if you think about Airbnb, and they take about three to 7% on the host side. Mm. So for three to 7%, you can barely process a credit card 
today yeah. in an independent business. So they, and, and they do all this marketing for you, assuming you're really good and your ratings are high. The algorithms will allow you to be shown frequently in the mm -hmm. context of a, of a related search. Yeah. I mean, really, how can you go wrong? And so it's that empowerment of people to take their, their assets and use them in business ways. It's the empowerment of people to get involved with their community, as you noted. Mm. It's the empowerment of people to do good in their community. Um, and it's the empowerment to, to make a living. And mm. many, many people are making very good livings using their assets uh, in the context of Airbnb. So I mean, that's fascinating because actually, if you think about it, um, the Airbnb's customers are their hosts. They are Effective. absolutely brilliantly thought through, and most people don't see it, you know, because so the, the, so the demand is so easy to get. I mean, hmm. I can get much more varied options if I go look at Airbnb. I can get a real discount off the option if that's what I'm wanting. I can mm -hmm. get a very, I can go to a, I can stay in a castle if I want on sure. Airbnb, right? So, so the options are completely broad. So there's always this demand. Mm. Uh, for off the grid and unique and inexpensive. What there is a harder thing to do is to get someone to say, I'm going to let my castle <laughs> be yeah. available to someone tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, sure. Now, it just kind of feels to me that whole empowerment thought thing is like if you kind of, if you understand that the hosts are Airbnb's sort of um, direct customers, then effectively what they're doing is they're going, we're going to do everything in our power to ensure that you are successful. Absolutely. And it's amazing. In the book, we talk about a lot of parts of, you know, rural Africa that people are traveling to with tribal women who, you know, have their husbands have left them and they have their home and that's all they have. And their right. survival is to, and they're teaching these people how to become hospitality providers, right? That what nice. would make it an attractive location for people. To nice. To. Yeah. So, so let me ask you, uh, Joseph is like, you know, I mean, are these, I mean, has Airbnb been built on these principles since their reception, or did they start with kind of like uh, kind of one or two, and then develop others along the way? Because it's so they've done it. They've done it the, both, right? Like you know, in a way, they they started with very little, uh, and they thought they started with a basic premise that if we can use this platform, we can get people in and out. They didn't really understand the drivers, uh, emotional drivers. I don't right, think. right. But then when they did, then they overdid it, right? Like so, they put like 10 principles in play right and now they've scaled back their values down to five so you know i think one of the things that you learn when you watch them is that that uh they were kind of clueless and then they became overly enlightened and then they had to get realistic um so uh, mm. yeah because you can't run an organization with 10 values or 12 values or i mean zappos does a pretty good job but most companies you know the more values the less memorable yeah uh, the less operational so uh, so they got down to, I think, a, a much more modest handful, and they execute against those very effectively. And as you kind of alluded to earlier, and I've mentioned this, is that you've written in depth about a number of these companies like Starbucks, Zappos, Mercedes, Benz in the U.S., now Airbnb, uh, you know, Ritz-Carlton, and, and so on and so forth. I mean, I mean, that's a lot of in-depth research. I mean, are are you able to sort of like uh, almost distill any overarching lessons to be learned or just that, you know what, it's hard? Yeah, no, no, no. That, that's <laughs> true too, as you and I know. And I think we're going to be in business for a week or two left still. Uh, it's so hard out there. And there's a lot of people striving. You know, there's some numbers that say like 92% of all senior leadership teams are trying to deliver a differentiated customer experience, but customer sat is going down. So yeah. clearly it is hard. But beyond that, I mean, from, from what I really call out of it is that, and, in, and this is changing. I think early on, I thought it was all about the people and people who really understood and could deliver a differentiated customer experience. I think Airbnb and probably the last series of books that I've written have all been identifying increasingly that this is still a human powered endeavor. Human mm. experience requires humans. Mm. Um, that said, it needs to be aided by technology very yeah. smartly. So what you're seeing, I think increasingly, and Airbnb is such a great example, it really is a online platform that has to be delivered by humans uh, when people show up. Yeah. And sometimes you have no human contact except somebody greets you with a text message or whatever, but there still needs to be some humanity involved in mm. the deliverable of the 
thing. And so uh, what I'm seeing them doing particularly well is using AI, uh, amazing technologies that they use. You know, let's, let's pretend, Adrian, that you have, have book places that have bunk beds as yeah. a history. And you're, but you never search for places with bunk beds. It's just you, when you see the picture of a bunk bed, for whatever reason, that catches you and you book it. Let's also assume that I have a place with a bunk bed that I failed to put it in my written description. Right. But I have a picture in there that has a bunk bed. And now you're searching for a place. Never mention bunk beds. You're just searching for a place in my town because of your past history of using bunk beds and because there is a bunk bed that I've never identified in words but is being visually analyzed by the site, they right. can put that in front of you for your consideration. Now, those technologies are amazing to me and that's where we're heading, I think. Yeah. But in addition to that, if you show up and you happen to, upon that place with a bunk bed and I treat you like crap, you're yeah. still not gonna come back to the website. Yeah, no, that's you're not true. gonna. That, and so that's what I think we're seeing increasingly across the brand landscape. How do you marry these two things together where I give you the technology you need when you want it and the people are available when you opt into humans? Mm. No, absolutely. I think that's, um, yeah. you know, it's funny. It's like, uh, it feels to me that um, <clears throat> if you think about nature, I think about particularly about human nature and our, our, our um, road to progress, as it were, um, is that we always have this, we have this tendency to undershoot and overshoot continually over time and then learn the lessons and then converge to back to trend. And it just seems to happen in waves, but, but we're always undershooting and overshooting. And it's almost a bit like we overshot on the technology and now we're kind of, you know, a bit like what Airbnb did is they did, oh, we did, we started with this and then we went to 12 principles or whatever. And now we're kind of boiling it back to five because you, you, you understand what's realistic and what's, you know, what's, what's manageable. And I think we're sort of in that sort of, um, um, well, I think we're possibly on the verge of that is that people have gone almost like overboard with, with technology and the promise of technology, but then, then a whole bunch of customers are pushing back and going, actually, that's a little bit too much. Yeah, you know, Starbucks is a good example. There are robots now that will make your latte. Not many people actually like getting their their coffee served by robots. Yeah. But uh, where Starbucks is just opening up in New York City in a test and learn is stores where you mobile order, mobile pay, and there is no other way to buy the coffee, but a person hands it to you when you walk in. Mm -hmm. So it's it's all digitally interfaced on the purchase side, but when you go in to get your coffee, you just walk straight up to the counter. There's nothing else in the store, and someone hands it to you. Yeah. Um, so I think that that's kind of where we're heading, that mid-correction point against, as you put, overreach and underreach. Yeah. So uh, just let me switch gears a little bit and, and kind of dip into that kind of sizable brain of yours and ask you a little bit about a few questions about where we go from here. I mean, because I'd love to get your perspective on what you think the future, I mean, it might just be that you're going to repeat exactly what you just said, because I was going to ask you, what is the future of customer service customer experience look like and what do you think some of the key ch challenges are uh, that lie ahead I think that it could be a little of a repeat but I hope not I mean in some fundamental level if we get into the life of our customer and we walk the journey maps that many of us have been creating all these years mm. through the personas of our customers our core customer segments and we look at how they use our products and services we are going to see a clear pathway to the future and that pathway is going to be this hybrid experience of online offline I don't care you, know, you to me the brand just need to be where I am and I need to be able to use it the way I use it, when I want it, where I want it, how I want it, as memorably and personally as possible. And so from a fundamental level, one moment I might engage your brand and I want a person, another moment I want a technology. At some point I may want a person via technology using kind of, you know, digital uh, sort of options like what we're doing right now. We're not sitting mm. in the same room together, but we are personally connected. Mm. Um, so I think you're gonna see that hybrid journey and brands are going to have to deliver against the use cases of customers as they weave in and out of that seamlessly for them, but challenging for the brand to deliver the right products at the right time based on it. So sometimes mm -hmm. I want convenience, sometimes I want a person. Sometimes I want a person and convenience. Right. So meet me where I am and wow me with great people when, when they're in front of me. So that, I mean, that's, that, I mean, that's great. I bet they, they, you know, you know, as you know, as well as I do, that's easier said than done, right? <laughs> but I like saying it. Yeah, it no, so of course, easy. of course. Yeah, it was very people, cool to people, say. People, people like, yeah, 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 nod their head. <laughs> yeah, it's great, it's great. I love it, I love it. And then they kind of like, they try and they go like, that's a really steep uh, hill. Yeah, it's yeah, a really it's steep a hill. One. 
Um, so like, what are going to be some of the key characteristics that firms are going to either have to find or nurture or grow um, that's going to help them achieve that type of you know, adaptability, responsiveness. That they're so I, I think it's really hopefully laid out in the Airbnb way. I mean, at one level, it is all about design. It's all about right. agile design. It's the capacity to be very quick and responsive to your customers based on your awareness of what the customer wants, needs, and desires. It is that, and that takes great design and technology engineers. It also takes another element because some of these companies are so designed and technology oriented that there's no people left in them. I mean, their minds have, their souls have been sucked out of them in the service of ones and zeros. Right. Um, so finding the replacement of soul. So it is an open mindset culture. It is a scrum uh, agile culture and it's one that drives human service as well. Those are, those are short in supply and most focused on one or the other. And so being the brand that is a little uh, kind of, I guess, uh, I, I would say renaissance in the mm. sense of having elements of those three very disparate, uh, disparate competencies, that, that's the ones that will win in the future. Perfect. So Joseph, um, you know, we talked a little bit about the, the, the industry, we talked a little about the book. Is there anything um, else that you'd like to add about the book before I ask you a couple of just like final wrap up kind of questions? No, just that we, you know, people can learn more about the book at Airbnb Way. Um, there's awesome. no the in the website. It's just Airbnb Way um, <laughs> dot com. And at the site, we also have a contest we're running for people in the in the continental United States to go to San Francisco and tour Airbnb. And there's no purchase necessary. And they can find out more about that on the site. And that contest runs through December 16th. Perfect. So um, yeah, just head over there if they want to learn more. I will make sure we get all that linked up and give that a bit big, a big push. But so come to my final well, a couple of questions. One is that you know, when I speak to people that that listen to the, the you know the podcast and they tell me that you know this is all very well, but sometimes it's like, oh, just tell me what to do, tell me where to start. So like, can I can people say you know? So I ask people so like, for somebody listening in to this or reading the highlights and they want to improve their service or the experience that they deliver to their customers. I mean. So if, yes. you were to, if you were to say to them, do this one thing, yeah, here's what do I do. two things, what would you say? Go tomorrow, talk to every single person and ask them what every customer should feel. And if they don't all say the same answer, think about what you want them to say and define that as the true north of your brand. Train, 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 train to that because human beings have to improvise to deliver that emotional outcome. And if you haven't defined it and if you go and assess your team and find that they're not aligned, you've got some work to do. Perfect. I love it. Love it. And so one final thing, which then comes as brings us kind of full circle back to the sort of the, the new rebranded name of the podcast, which is Punk CX. It was all about this book that I wrote um, called Punk CX. It came out in the Which summer. is great, by the way. People should get it. But Thank you, man. Thank okay, you. That's you kind of super kind of you. Um, but what I've been doing is my, on the back of it is asking people for their, uh, it's a piece of social research, ongoing social research. Um, so I've been asking people to come up with like, one word that they think would describe a punk approach to customer experience. What would that be, Joseph, for you? Oh boy, um, I think I, I said it in. Um, I think I said it as the first word in the Zappos book, and that's unconventional. Perfect. Right. Love it. And building on that, you know, what company or brand do you think epitomizes a punk? Approach well, in that book, I, in, the, in that book, after I said the word unconventional, I think I, I quoted a tweet from somebody who said, I saw Winnie, po Winnie the Pooh running through the parking lot. Yes, I work at Zappos. I think Zappos <laughs> is super unconventional. And, you know, they've just created a culture where people, you know, play their way into purposeful uh, creation of value for customers. Perfect. And also, uh, Tony Shea has been has famously been known to sport a Mohican from time to time, which is all the better. Right? <laughs> Joseph, uh, thank you uh, for for that. Uh, congratulations on a um, another comprehensive story about one of these iconic kind of brands that we hold up as being, you know, leaders in their in in their fields. I mean, I think it's a great piece of work. I congratulate you on that. I want and and thank you again for. Um, sharing your time and a little bit of insight into the book um, uh, with us today. Um, final thing, I guess, where can people get the book? Is it like the usual sort of suspects? Yeah, all the places you get, get it otherwise. If you go to Airbnb Way, we have all the links to all the bookstores. So it's all good. Awesome. Uh, well, once again, Joseph, 
thank you so, so much. That's been awesome. You know, I'm a huge fan of yours and we are, I guess, colleagues, competitors. All, I don't know. All I know is you're one of the super nicest guys in the space of CX. So thank you very much for your time today. <laughs> you're very welcome. Thank you. It's so kind of you. Well, that was cool. I hope you enjoyed it. I did. And I always do, actually, because I always learn something new when I speak to some of these amazing people. And it's always something new that I can incorporate into my writing, speaking workshops and other sort of advisory work that I do. Now, if you're interested in learning about any of that sort of stuff, uh, then you can find out more about how I work with clients over at adrianswinsco.com. But one final thing before I go, please consider heading over to iTunes or Spotify or whichever podcast platform you choose to use and do leave a review. Every little helps, as we say. Anyway, that's all for now. Thank you for listening and do tune in again soon. All the very best. Cheers. Bye.